Good evening, I'm Andrew Chang. Adrian is away. Tonight, an incredible medical first. A pig's heart transplanted into the chest of an American man in a last-ditch effort to save his life. He said, I don't want to die. And he said, if I do, maybe you'll learn something to help others. How it happened and what doctors are watching for next. Also tonight, thousands of kids return to class. I'm probably the most concerned that I have been about sending them to school through the entire pandemic. The balancing act for parents, teachers, and kids. Plus, a generation mourns a TV dad. I have a date tonight! The latest in the investigation into Bob Saget's death. And a crashed plane, a speeding train, and a daring rescue with just seconds to spare. Go, 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 go. This is The National. Well, we have witnessed a lot of medical and scientific marvels over the last couple of years. The development of COVID treatments and vaccines certainly comes to mind. But the story we begin with tonight feels astonishing, even beyond that. It's about a man alive in a Maryland hospital tonight with a pig's heart beating in his chest. The surgery was a first, a scientific leap. The result, not just making history, but fueling hope that one day, long waits for the critically ill might be a thing of the past. Christine Birak shows us how the drama unfolded and a warning, you will see the surgery in progress. Thank you. That is the heart of a genetically engineered pig. The organ looks perfect. Can I get two regular Surgeons in Baltimore went to work Friday, transplanting that heart into a 57-year-old man with life-threatening heart disease, whose unique condition meant he wasn't eligible for a human heart transplant. He, he said to me two very important things. He said, I don't want to die. And he said, if I do, maybe you'll learn something to help others. The groundbreaking surgery lasted eight hours, ending with this the pig's heart beating inside the body of David Bennett Sr., who doctors say is currently doing well. We were quite pleased that uh, as we separated from the heart-lung machine, the animal heart was uh, functioning, by my eye at least, just about as normal as we could have expected. The heart transplant comes just months after surgeons in New York successfully attached the kidney of a genetically modified pig to a woman who'd suffered brain death. In order to use both the kidney and heart, doctors knocked out certain pig genes that often lead to rejection. We have uh, modified 10 genes in this, in this pig heart. Uh, four genes were knocked out. Three of them responsible for producing antibodies that causes rejection. With thousands of Canadians waiting for heart, kidney and other organ transplants every year, doctors are hoping these procedures will one day save lives. But there are ethical and other challenges. If they can do this on a large scale and produce a lot of pigs that they could then harvest organs from that would not be rejected by your body if you needed a transplant, that's going to be very, very interesting. You good? The man's body could still reject the heart, but for now, it's doing everything it should while pumping new hope into the future of organ transplants. Christine Virak, CBC News, Toronto. Well, turning to COVID now, in late breaking news tonight, CBC News has confirmed students in Ontario will be going back to class a week from today. For some, that will bring joy. For others, nerves, something people in BC and Alberta experienced today. For them, in class learning did, in fact, get back underway. Their winter breaks had been extended by the Omicron surge, but that surge is far from over. Hospitalizations are still increasing. And so, as Deanna Sumanak Johnson shows us, today, Parents had to weigh the risks. For Vancouver father Gord Lau and his two children, today was back to school, but deciding to send them was not easy. I'm probably the most concerned that I have been about sending them to school through um, the entire pandemic. Um, we know that Omicron is very transmissible, and um, I believe that there are steps that could be taken to make our schools uh, safer. The decision was easier for the Surrey mom. She shelled out for a tutor last year to help her daughter catch up and also worries about her mental health. The bottom line is that her education is really important. In Alberta, schools are also reopening today, though some families are keeping their kids at home 
Others are excited for return to class. What do you think, buddy? What? About having school again. Good. Alberta is sending out surgical masks and rapid test kits to schools. The government says all schools should have them by the end of this week. B.C. plans to expand access to rapid tests in schools this month. Measures experts say could mitigate, though not eliminate, the risk of infection. What we really are going to be doing is trying to negotiate with the least amount of damage, the least amount of severe illness that we can. But in provinces further east, where schools are still online, there are also frustrations. Pediatric organizations in both Manitoba and Ontario have petitioned provincial governments for an urgent return to in-person learning. From our part, it was quite clear um, that you know we are seeing more damage being done from the children not attending school than from COVID infection itself. This pharmacist and parent of a kindergartner is doing what he can to get schools open by providing boosters to education workers. It's been challenging and flat out heartbreaking to watch a four-year-old stare at a screen for six hours and the frustration that she has with wanting to communicate with her classmates and being unable to. And this is not a way that a child should live. And so Deanna, for those provinces still doing virtual learning, what is being done to get kids back to school safely? Andrew, Ontario has announced it is prioritizing education workers for boosters. That's on top of those N95 masks for teachers and additional HEPA filters for schools that the province has already promised. Quebec is committing 7 million of those rapid tests they're expecting to get from the federal government to schools and daycares. And teachers there are also eligible for PCR tests. And as of tonight, Ontario and Quebec are both planning on sending kids back a week from today and tonight Manitoba has confirmed its plans to also reopen schools on January 17th. Andrew. Okay, Deanna, thank you. Well, a record number of Canadians are in hospital with COVID-19. More than 6,700 people. That is putting incredible pressure on a system that's already straining. Emergency services can barely keep up. And as Thomas Daigle shows us, provinces want Ottawa to step in. The latest sign of a healthcare system under strain Ambulances lined up waiting to transfer patients to overwhelmed hospitals. During busier periods, there may be delays in responding to lower priority calls while we respond to the higher priority calls. Over the weekend, 50 Toronto ambulances were out of service at one time due to transfer delays caused by COVID. The result, fewer paramedics available to respond to calls and a delayed response to others. This is kind of a tragedy that we're seeing across the city that, that really is hard on our members and, and, and really kind of puts us in a moral injury type of situ situation. The ripple effects of the Omicron wave affecting more and more people, from PCR tests being sent out of Newfoundland for processing. Our capacity to deliver on those tests in-house uh, was exceeded. To Red Cross staff deployed to Nova Scotia to help with vaccination. Almost everywhere, healthcare workers are struggling to keep up. We have a lot of patients and they're being bed spaced. We're doing the best we can, but it's obviously not ideal and we recognize that. So I think the ripple down effects are affecting almost everybody right now. Canada's premiers on a call with the prime minister demanding more support during this crisis. Ontario's Doug Ford asking for billions of dollars in funding that Ontario could use to accelerate progress in delivering better care. His province still facing a weeks-long Omicron crisis ahead. It's relatively likely that, you know, second half, somewhere in second half of January, we will see this plateauing. He points out with PCR testing only available to a small portion of the population, it can be hard to make accurate modeling for the weeks ahead. Ontario's most telling data remains hospitalizations and ICU admissions, and both are still going up. Thomas Dagg, CBC News, Toronto. A late-breaking development to tell you about out of Quebec tonight. Our colleagues at Radio Canada have confirmed the province's director of public health has resigned. Dr. Horatio Arruda has submitted a letter of resignation after nearly 12 years in the position. Over the past two years, he has figured prominently in Quebec's fight against COVID-19. An official announcement is expected tomorrow from the Premier, François Legault. U.S. health officials are now advising Americans against coming to Canada. 
The Centers for Disease Control moved Canada's threat level to very high today. That's its highest risk category for travel. There are about 80 other destinations in the same category, including the UK, France and Italy. Well, we're learning new details tonight about what happened as fire and smoke tore through a New York City high rise yesterday. 17 people were killed, including eight children. Susan Ormiston takes us there. Shooting flames, scary enough, but it was thick, black, acrid smoke that killed. We got smoke from the rear of the building. Hearing the smoke alarm, some residents made a dash for the stairs, or tried to, like Daisy Mitchell. I went to the stairs, they opened the door, it just blew me back in the house, and I panicked, and I told my husband, let me in the house. I can't see, I'm blind, I can't see, I can't see. If I stayed out there another three seconds, I would have been gone too. The fire began in a bedroom on the third floor on a cold Sunday morning. A space heater sparked it. But when the family fled in terror, the apartment door didn't close behind them. Fire was contained to the hallway just outside this two-story apartment, but the smoke uh, traveled throughout the building, and the smoke is what caused the deaths and the serious injuries. The commissioner says the building did have self-closing doors, but some pushed open, stayed open. They're not supposed to. Fire alarms did go off, but residents said that had happened before. There's been some stories that the alarm system went off uh, regularly. Uh, our investigation will determine that. This is an unspeakable tragedy. The mayor said dozens of injured, gasping for air or unconscious, their faces covered with soot, were found on every floor of the building. Close the door. Close the door. We're going to double down on that message. This painful moment can turn into a purposeful moment. At least 17 didn't survive, including eight kids, one as young as four. More are still critical in hospital. The four deadliest fires in New York City in the past 30 years have all been in the Bronx. And after each, calls for tighter regulation and funding of public housing, and in this case, why those doors didn't swing closed. I don't understand, I don't understand why, why that happened like that, but God spared me. Susan Ormiston, CBC News, Washington. Well, in the UK, Prime Minister Boris Johnson is under fire again following reports that as many as 100 people were invited to a private gathering at his residence in spite of COVID restrictions. Britain's ITV News obtained an emailed invite to the event, which urged guests to bring their own booze to the Downing Street gathering back in May of 2020 during the first lockdown. Reports say both Johnson and his wife attended. It comes after allegations the government held a rule-breaking Christmas party that same year. Well, Serbian tennis star Novak Djokovic is back on the tennis court after winning his legal battle to play in Australia. The unvaccinated player has been released from hotel quarantine. But as Jamie Strachan shows us, the Australian government might have the final say. Novak Djokovic is free to pursue another Australian Open title. An Australian judge reinstated his visa and ordered him released from a Melbourne immigration detention hotel. Police had to clear a path for a car believed to be carrying the world's number one tennis player. He is a national hero. And this is what happens when you touch the Serbian national hero. Court documents show the unvaccinated Djokovic was cleared by state officials and granted an exemption based on a positive COVID test on December 16th. After arriving around midnight, federal border agents held him for hours before rejecting the exemption, ordering him deported. So you're giving me legally 20 minutes to try and provide additional information that I don't have? At 4 o'clock in the morning, Djokovic asked. The judge ruled it was unreasonable to cancel the visa without giving Djokovic a chance to properly respond. It's been a battle. Uh, for all of us, it's not just Djokovic's Nova, family has accused the Australian government of making this case about okay, politics. So, uh, Novak is only fighting for uh, the liberty of choice. Djokovic has faced scrutiny because of his skepticism about COVID and vaccination. His family ended their press conference today when asked about his maskless appearances the day after his positive test. Was he at the on the 17th of oh, December? Oh, Okay, so uh, this press conference is adjourned. 
Djokovic tweeted this picture, center court at Rod Laver Stadium, saying, Despite all that has happened, I want to stay and try to compete. That's still to be seen. Australia's immigration minister still has the power to revoke Djokovic's visa, something authorities say is a very real possibility. Jamie Strachan, CBC News, Toronto. Well, turning back to this country now, a young hockey player from Prince Edward Island says he's been benched for speaking out over how his league's governing body handled an allegation of racism. Kayla Hounsell has his story. On and off the ice, Keegan Mitchell says he always stands up for his friends. He has it tattooed on his torso. Stand by those who stand by you. And he says that's what he was trying to do when he defended his teammate. That player doesn't want to be named, but says he was the subject of an anti-Asian remark during a game. That's like, there's no place for this in the game. Um, you shouldn't be saying that. Uh, just basically what everyone should know, I said. Uh, and then I slashed him. The slashing got Mitchell a two-game suspension, the same punishment delivered to the other player accused of hurling the derogatory comment. Hockey PEI says its overseeing body, Hockey Canada, has a policy against racial slurs, an automatic five-game suspension, but only if the official overhears it. Two wrongs don't make a right, so, you know, if, if somebody um, uses a term or, or a derogatory slur that somebody's not, it doesn't give you the right to, to violently hurt someone else. Mitchell took to social media, criticizing Hockey PEI's response as disgraceful. The organization then sent him a letter saying his post was in violation of its policy and he'd be suspended indefinitely. This is bystander training and he did an exceptional job. The suspension was a complete, um, maybe emotional reaction by Hockey PEI um, and it's, it's not right. And there's only one body to blame for this and that's Hockey PEI. And I'm... I'm embarrassed to say that because I've always been a member and I've always held them in high regard. Today, I don't. It comes just weeks after another allegation of racism in PEI hockey. In that case, the N-word was said to a black player. It's still under investigation. If this is the way it has to go for me to uh, make it right for other people going through this, then I'll do that to the day I die. I'll defend anyone. Kayla Hounsel, CBC News, Halifax. Well, in British Columbia tonight, people are bracing for yet another atmospheric river. Heavy rain is expected to hit most of BC's south coast starting tomorrow. Susanna De Silva shows us how tired British Columbians are getting ready for more bad weather. Once more, watching the skies. I'm thinking, oh no, not again. <laughs> Trina Inns and her family have moved six times after November's flooding forced them out of their home in Abbotsford. Snow, cold and more rain have hampered their repairs ever since. I can't do any sandbagging or anything. The water comes up from underneath. Current models vary, some predicting more than 200 millimeters of rain in some places. While this storm is not expected to be as intense as the one in the fall, it could hit areas that are already damaged and covered in snow that will melt. Weakened river banks, uh, weakened mountainsides, that may be a tipping point for extra flooding, uh, potential for landslides. So even though it's not as big of an event, uh, the compounding effects may be a problem. This has some communities preparing to provide sandbags and monitoring dikes. With everything that we've already been going through and, and that, it's just, you know, it's adding insult to injury. And just hearing the term atmospheric river is difficult for many who lost so much in November. The city of Merritt today tweeting that the storm is not expected to cause problems there, but said we understand the stress this weather may cause residents after the events of the last few months and recommend staying informed and prepared to counteract anxiety. The storm is raising the avalanche risk in many areas. People are being urged to clear storm drains and watch the forecast. But some wonder about the longer term. Will this be the future? What will happen in the spring? Is this what we're going to go through all the time? Like what, what precautions are, you know, going to be taken to help prevent further damage? Like, is it worth doing the renovation in order to move back in if we're just going to flood again? A question many are asking after months of historic weather. Susanna De Silva, CBC News, Vancouver. Well, a dramatic rescue was caught on camera after a plane crash. The pilot pulled to safety just seconds before this. Go, 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 go. 
Next, the race to save a man's life as a train barreled down on him and the bystanders who ran towards the wreckage to help. Plus, advice for Canadians who've had COVID-19. What changes after you recover? And more than a decade after running away, the cat did come back. When I saw her, um, her face looked a lot grumpier. A surprise reunion with a long lost pet. We're back in two. Welcome back. A pilot in California is lucky to be alive tonight. Pulled to safety from his crashed plane just seconds before it was hit by a train. Katie Simpson takes us through the daring rescue caught on camera. Officers have less than 15 seconds left to save this injured pilot's life. Body camera footage shows police racing against an oncoming train, frantically pulling the man from the wreckage just in time. A witness captures another angle of the dramatic rescue, whistles sounding the train clearly cannot stop. The collision shoots debris into a crowd of nearby onlookers, yet another near miss. Luis Jimenez recorded that video. You know, I was with my father in the car and we were driving down that road from seeing family. And when all of a sudden he says, look, and he sees the plane land uh, from a failed takeoff. Jimenez says that's when they stopped the car and ran over to see if they could help the pilot. He is awake. He is aware and uh, he says that he is okay. While they were unable to free the man, police arrived moments later, a relief at first that quickly faded. Describe for me the moment you realize a train is coming. Our hearts sank to our stomach. Uh, once we hear the, the bells ringing and we see the sirens flashing, we knew there was trouble. They were able to pull him out just seconds before that train pulverized that Cessna plane. And um, it, it all happened so fast. How are you feeling? I'm still shaken up. Jimenez is grateful the pilot is expected to make a full recovery and credits the Los Angeles Police Department for working quickly in a crisis. Without our teamwork, without all of us pitching in and having the same mindset, which I think any officer on the department probably would have felt the same way, um, he might not have made it. Investigators now want to know why train service wasn't stopped after the crash was first reported and whether this harrowing rescue could have been avoided. Katie Simpson, CBC News, Washington. Well, New York real estate heir and convicted murderer Robert Durst has died while in custody. The millionaire turned fugitive was convicted last year of killing his friend and sentenced to life in prison. Two days after his sentencing, he was admitted to hospital with COVID and placed on a ventilator. He was 78. Senior officials from the U.S. and Russia met face-to-face -face in Geneva today to begin week-long talks to try to ease tensions at the Ukrainian border. But as Briar Stewart reports tonight from Kiev, people there are hoping for the best and preparing for the worst. Beneath this city building, a bomb shelter built during the Cold War. It's one of thousands of spaces being inspected by Nikolai Budnik's team in case they have to be used. This one is meant to house essential workers. Our goal is to have shelters for 100 percent of our population, he said. Today in Geneva, high-level talks between the U.S. and Russia, an effort to try and avert the risk of war. This evening, Russia denied its planning an attack and repeated a demand that the U.S. has already called a non-starter. It's absolutely mandatory uh, to make sure that Ukraine never, never, ever becomes a member of NATO. Expectations for these talks were low even before they started. But that doesn't mean that people here think a large attack is imminent or even likely. At this market, people are focused more on the final days of the holiday season instead of escalating tensions. I wouldn't say we worry a lot. Like, our army right now is one of the strongest army in Europe. Even if Russia invades Ukraine, that will not make them any sense in an economical way. By that he means the punishing sanctions the U.S. and NATO have promised if Russia launches an attack. And this Kiev-based right defense I'm journalist not, not believes that threat will be the biggest deterrent for a country with an ultra-rich elite. Our enemy is 
is evil but not stupid. They always need their billions in the West. They enjoy their villas in southern France. They got kids in the West, families in the West, and lots of assets. So they are definitely evil but not stupid. More high-level talks will take place later this week involving NATO and other European officials, but it's not clear just what they will accomplish. After today's discussion, the U.S. said there can be no real diplomacy with Russia unless it starts withdrawing its troops near the Ukrainian border. Briar Stewart, CBC News, Kiev. Well, as we approach the Winter Olympics in Beijing tonight, we're looking into allegations China has been harassing and intimidating people in Canada. It was pretty obvious that I was being followed and watched and surveilled. Next, the Canadians facing hateful messages after criticizing the Chinese government. But first... Just an absolute gut punch. The loss of an American TV dad. Tributes to Bob Saget a little later. With less than a month to go until the Winter Olympics in Beijing, we are getting a close-up look at the hardware athletes are hoping to take home. These medals just passed a final quality test named Tongxin. The five rings symbolize the Olympics and Chinese culture and are decorated with ice, snow and cloud patterns. Now, the Olympics are supposed to be all about those medals and the sport, but that China is hosting these games complicates that for some. So over the next few weeks, we are taking a deeper look at some of the issues in the relationship between Ottawa and Beijing, beginning tonight with Terence McKenna and allegations China is harassing and intimidating people here for criticizing the regime. The Olympic Games are universal. In October, there was an elaborate ceremony near Mount Olympus in Greece where the Olympic flame was handed over to Chinese officials to begin the long voyage to Beijing. The ceremony was disrupted by Tibetan Canadian Chemi Lamo. How can Beijing be allowed to host the Olympics given that they are committing genocide against the Uyghurs, the Eastern? We got stormed by of course, the security officials, uh, about eight or 12, just tackled us to the ground and made sure that we didn't get into the way of any cameras. Chemi Lamo and her friends were arrested and spent two days in jail, charged with destruction of an archeological site. Arriving back home, she received a hero's welcome from Toronto Tibetans. She says that her activism against the Chinese communist government really took off two years ago when she was elected president of the University of Toronto Scarborough Campus Student Council. She received more than congratulatory messages. Along with that came thousands and thousands of threats, death threats, rape threats against me, my family members, simply because of my Tibetan identity. One guy actually wrote a rap about how he was going to rape me in Chinese or Mandarin and, and then said, oh wait, you wouldn't understand that, so let me send it to you in English and then translated it and sent it to me in English. One thing that gets me choked up, reading the message that said, your mom's dead. So I'd have to check in with my mom to make sure that she was safe. Once I said on my Instagram story, oh, is this hate from China as a joke when it first started? And someone messaged me and said, no, bitch, I'm here. Chemi Lamo identified the Chinese Students and Scholars Association at the University of Toronto as a source for her on-campus harassment. The organization is mainly composed of international students from mainland China under the leadership of the Chinese embassy. And so it was pretty obvious that I was being followed and watched and surveilled on campus, whether it was students or other people. Where do you think these messages were coming from? I think these messages were coming uh, uh, definitely from the Chinese embassy. There was another incident involving the Chinese Students and Scholars Association at McMaster University in Hamilton. When Uyghur Canadian Rukia Turdes showed up to speak about the oppression of her people in China. She was abused and disrupted by pro-Beijing students who were apparently directed by the Chinese embassy. The CSSA was banned from further activity at McMaster. The Chinese Student Scholars Associations are reporting to the embassy what's going on on campus. Charles Burton was a Canadian diplomat in China and then a university professor in Canada. And if a Chinese student 
you know, um, spoke out of turn or seemed to be affiliating with uh, um, other student groups that, that support human rights or, or, uh, or the rights of, of ethnic minorities in China, like Tibetans and Uyghurs, this could be potentially career destroying, would likely lead to some uh, degree of intimidation of their families back in China. And in general, um, you know, it keeps the students in line. Hong Kong, stay strong! China's intimidation of Chinese Canadians occasionally spills out into the streets. Free Hong Kong! Free China! In August of 2019, Canadians in support of Hong Kong democracy announced they would protest in several cities across the country on the same day. They encountered well organized and well funded counter protests by pro Beijing crowds. In Halifax, Toronto, and Vancouver, the pro Beijing protesters carried the same printed posters, the same brand new China flags, and shouted the same slogans. pro-democracy demonstrators tried to sing the Canadian national anthem, but were shouted down by the pro-Beijing group singing the Chinese anthem. The former head of the Canadian Security and Intelligence Service, Richard Fadden, has no doubt it was all organized by the Chinese government. I think the, the Chinese state has, has taken a fairly clear decision that these demonstrations affect its uh, it's honor and they need to be countered. So using their agents in Canada, they do just that. Uh, I think they have every consulate or em the embassy, I think, have lists of people who are willing to go out and, and, and do this kind of demonstration. In an especially ironic moment, the pro Beijing crowd was led by a motorcade of expensive Ferrari and Lamborghini sports cars flying Chinese communist flags. They revved their engines to drown out the pro democracy speakers, like Gloria Fung. Freedom of expression everywhere. Actually, this is about foreign force uh, intimidating us and also jeopardizing our Canadians freedom of expression uh, on Canadian soil. These people with Ferraris are usually somehow or other connected to the senior levels of the Chinese Communist Party and and I think the expectation is that they will uh, show their gratitude to the party by by supporting the party's political ends. In Vancouver, the pro-Beijing protesters pushed things a bit further. They surrounded a Catholic church where the Hong Kong democracy supporters were having a prayer meeting. Ma'am, what's your name? Ma'am, excuse me, ma'am. Oh, ma'am, I saw you yesterday. I am not going to answer. I saw you yesterday at the transit station. What are you doing? I don't to answer any of your questions. Father Richard Sue was at the pro-democracy prayer meeting in the Vancouver church. They were trying to barge in to break up our prayer meeting. Uh, it got so bad that the neighbors of the church we were meeting in had to call the police. And even as we were leaving afterwards, uh, they were trying to take our pictures to harass us, to dox us. And they were trying to stop us praying, speaking, and meeting in Canada, trying to stop us from living our Canadian values in our own country. Mr. Speaker, I believe if you seek it, you will find unanimous consent. Conservative Member of Parliament Michael Chong says that the federal government has to take action against China's diplomats in Canada. The Canadian government needs to haul the ambassador on the carpet and make it clear that that kind of interference in our society, in our universities, is unacceptable and that any diplomats or accredited uh, individuals that are involved with that will be de declared persona non grata and expelled from the country. Of course, the activities of the China Embassy and consulates are closely monitored by Canadian security services. But Canada's Global Affairs Department has traditionally taken the position that any expulsions of Chinese diplomats will only result in Canadian diplomats being kicked out of China. And so nothing happens. Terence McKenna, CBC News, Ottawa. Now, CBC News contacted the Chinese Embassy in Ottawa for comment, but they refused our request for an interview. 
Next, what Canadians need to know if they've had COVID-19. From the best time to get a booster shot to just how long immunity could last. Expert advice after the break. Welcome back. Tens of thousands of Canadians are catching COVID every day right now. And as booster shots roll out amid this Omicron wave, some who got sick are left wondering when should they roll up their sleeves. Julia Wong looks for answers. Tony Tremaine was double vaccinated when he got COVID-19 in mid-December. Now that he's recovered, he's wondering about his booster. I was curious to know what the optimum time would be to get the booster. BC's top doctor, Dr. Bonnie Henry, says there's no need to wait. Those who feel better after infection can get their booster shot. We know that the, the vaccine boosts that immunity, particularly to the, the spike protein, the one that binds into the cells. So it gives you super immunity. But advice varies on when they should get a booster. In Newfoundland and Labrador, symptoms should be resolved. In Ontario, people should wait for 30 days. In Quebec, the advice is to get one, but there's no word on timing. People should still get a booster. I think the harder part is when is the best time to boost? Dr. Lenora Saxinger says it depends on the variant. She recommends waiting up to six weeks when it's Omicron, but any time after recovery when it's Delta. The difference being reinfection with Omicron is still possible if you've had Delta. Anyone who's been infected from the middle of December on should probably consider it likely Omicron. And prior to that, you might consider it more likely Delta. Rushing from an infection to a booster probably isn't immediately necessary. And there may be trade-offs to waiting, say some experts. I think it's a better idea to wait uh, several months before getting boosted because then the boost will be more effective. It'll have a stronger effect. Um, Again, because the memory cells will be much more fully developed. Tremaine says he plans to wait and book an appointment for March. No, I, I don't feel um, any urgency to get it. I'd like to know that there is some scientific consensus out there, particularly since um, somebody must have been asking this question six months ago. But he will get boosted as Canada battles yet another wave of the pandemic. Julia Wong, CBC News, Edmonton. And joining me now, Dr. Peter Uni, Scientific Director of Ontario's COVID-19 Science Advisory Table. And Dr. Uni, just to follow up on this idea of immunity through infection and how long it lasts, once you recover from Omicron, how likely is it that you can be reinfected? Oh, we don't know yet for sure. Remember, you know, this virus has only been around for uh, less than two months and uh, we will see um, how this all plays out. The point really is that after you've been infected, you will certainly have good protection for at least six to eight weeks or so. And what about the idea of getting sick and then recovering, how that affects your ability to transmit the virus to others down the road? What do we know there? Yeah, again, we need to uh, probably just extrapolate from what we know with, uh, with third doses. And uh, this means that initially for six, eight or ten weeks or so, you're considerably less likely to get infected and therefore also to transmit to others. And then the neutralizing part of immunity will wane again. But what you benefit from, of course, is a protection against serious outcomes such as hospitalized you have mentioned. And this holds either for a third dose, but it also holds for people who have had two doses and uh, an infection. Right. So, so here's partly why I'm asking this. You, you know, I, I've seen people wondering if this is perhaps a, a blessing in disguise, the transmissibility of Omicron. This idea of, you know, get, get everyone infected now while the individual risk perhaps seems low, get to herd immunity sooner. Is, is that the wrong way to look at it? Look, right now the challenge we have is the healthcare system. No, it's a jolly bad idea right now actually to uh, to try to get infected because if you hit the jackpot uh, in a negative way and actually end up in our hospital or an ICU, you won't get optimal care anymore. We now need to keep our healthcare system afloat. The point is, once everybody has achieved some sort of immunity, either through vaccine, through infection or a combination of the two, the face of the pandemic will change and we will be much closer to endemicity. But timing is everything, as I think you're suggesting here. Dr. Uni, thank you. thank you so much. Thank you. And when we come back, paying tribute to a beloved TV dad. 
One of those people who said, anything you ever need, let me know, but meant it, actually, genuinely meant it. Memories of comedian Bob Saget, right after the break. <laughs> Fans of the Netflix hit Squid Game will recognize this man. Last night, Oh Young Soo became the first South Korean actor to win a Golden Globe for his role in the show, while Michaela J. Rodriguez from the TV series Pose made history as the first transgender woman to win Best Performance by an Actress in a television series drama. This year's show was also notably different from previous years. There was no televised ceremony, not even a red carpet. Well, the death of comedian and actor Bob Saget came suddenly this weekend. He was only 65, and now his friends, fans, and colleagues are remembering perhaps one of the most recognizable sitcom dads of all time. Saget himself, of course, was far edgier than his most famous role. Here's Eli Glasner. If you're a child of the 80s, Bob Saget might have been your TV dad, a familiar face you'd see channel surfing, maybe as the fastidious father from Full House. I have a date tonight. <laughs> and why not? <laughs> or the avuncular host of America's Funniest like Home Videos. <laughs> but Saget's first love was stand-up comedy. Mark Breslin remembers worrying about the young man with the guitar when he first started out. He was just amazing. It was like watching um, the very best camp counselor you ever had, except it was the kind of camp counselor who would slip you a Mickey at the end and tell you to go drink behind the trees. How do I look? Be brutal. Fine. Look good. You look fine. fine. Saget went on to spend eight seasons on Full House playing the mild-mannered widower. But when fans of Full House caught Saget's comedy act, they got this guy who stood on stage and opened up the filthiest mouth you can possibly imagine. And there was Saget last Saturday, sharing his joy about being back on stage. Next day, police discovered his body in a hotel room in Orlando, Florida. With an autopsy performed Monday, authorities say there were no signs of foul play or drug use. The news shocked friends. Just an absolute gut punch. But a common thread soon emerged of a kind soul always willing to help. He got me on stage at the Laugh Factory in Hollywood just with an email and text. He's like, no problem, I'll take care of it. An hour later, is like, here's the showtime, here's the date. Like, one of those people who said, anything you ever need, let me know, but meant it. Today, friends and fans paid tribute in front of the full house home and online where his castmate John Stamos said he would never, ever have another friend like him. And the actor who played DJ shared a photo adding 35 years wasn't long enough. Bob Saget was 65. Eli Glaster, CBC News, Toronto. Well, when we come back, the cat came back a decade later. I just had to move on and, you know, come to the conclusion that she wasn't going to be coming back. And then the cat came back. <laughs> the reunion, 12 years later, to be exact, in our moment. Now this is Loli the cat. Loli went missing in the summer of 2010, but this month Loli was found. The math, pretty straightforward on that one. It's a long time to be missing. It's our moment. It's just been a kind of a whirlwind to see my cat after, after 11 and a half years. 2022, New Year's Day, I got a call that your animal has been found. They said, we have Loli. And I said, Loli? Loli was my cat from 2010. And they said, well, we've got her here at the Vaughn Animal Services, if you'd like to pick her up. So I was in shock. And... Um, Quickly made plans with my partner uh, to pick her up in the next couple of days. Um, she's microchipped, so it had to be my cat. Uh, when I saw her, um, her face looked a lot grumpier. Otherwise, she looked exactly the same. I wish cats could talk so that she could tell me where she's been for the last 11 and a half years. But you know what? I'm glad that she's come to me now to be uh, taken care of in her older golden years. <laughs> So I love this story. Uh, Loli, by the way, is an adoptee. And, um, you know, Christine, 
says that she's not actually 100% sure if Loli recognizes her. She thinks she does because she's gotten some cuddles and some kisses, and I'm sure there are other more subtle signs than that. That's The National for this January 10th. Hope you have a great day.